All right. Uh, so here we are on Moodle, um, March 11th. So this is one more week of work. Then you'll be done with your project, or Sprint 2, um, although the actual latest drop point is the end of spring break. Right? So um, here we are at the 11th. We still have a week of class. And then here we are at spring break. And then there's that Sunday at the end of spring break. And that's the latest to do your project, your Sprint 2 drop. But if you have any issues, um, you know, come in for lab time Wednesday, Thursday. Just make sure. Touch and base if you have any issues. So what's going to happen this week is I'm going to cover in class today. I'm going to cover where I got. So I updated my user interface. I started getting um, the glowing and you know, opacity and changing the size of um, these paint objects. Maybe these these, dis these relative distance between how quickly you're stroking. And then I've updated some of the color aspects you see here. This is where I'll get to in class today. Um, about 45 minutes, 50 minutes, won't be the full time. Um, if you want to keep working on your project, you stay in class, you have questions, come see me. And then the online videos will be uh, based on where we currently are. Actually, let me click play real quick and let me show you where we're going to get to at the end of this class. So as I paint, let me, let me turn off the time destroy. So this is what a, a paint stroke looks like. Now you can adjust the size of it. So this is adjusting future paint strokes, but it's also adjusting the previous paint strokes. So say I want super big paint strokes, and as I continue painting, they're really big, or if I shrink them down, the, the previous and the current paint strokes are affected by the change of this size. Um, if you remember previously, that size wasn't really doing much. It was just um, impacting the first object that gets painted. The rest get like this dynamic sizing based on how quickly you're, you're paint stroking, but there was no way for the user at that point to change that. Now size impacts all everything, and it even impacts um, previous ones and current ones. And then you can mess around with the glow. And the opacity, or how transparent or opaque it is. So I decided to go with this setup. So based on whatever the time situation that the user sets, or that the current day, if they're happy with it, then they can change. Okay, I want it. It's nighttime. I want it like super glowy, and I'll pull down the opacity, and that looks fun. But if it's during the daytime, maybe I'll pull this down and, and change this in our what have you. Um, let me clear that out and just have a few strokes down. And then um, the color right now, the color only impacts future strokes, but for the online class, I'm going to have like little toggles that say, I've already kind of started building the toggles out. So like should this change impact the current stuff or only the future. So I have a toggle for the, the colors and we'll have a toggle for, um, right now I'm calling these like paint effects or, or paint. Yeah, probably paint effects is probably a good word for it. So you can change these color values for your future strokes. So I could put timer back on this and say, okay, I want green strokes. Now give me some some red and what have you. And then change the size of it. The glow. And so right now the size, glow, and opacity affects current paint strokes and future. And color only impacts future. But I'm going to get it to there'll be like two toggles. And you can decide how if you want to impact the current generation of paint strokes or not. The other thing to note is um, I updated the color sliders where they, they used to have a little box next to them and the, the, the value was in there. 
and so I tried to condense down my user interface. So I made the actual slider handles the color, and then I put the little number the text right on the slider toggles, right on the handles. And I'm probably going to go up here. And one of the students in the previous class wanted to put the actual numbers of the size and glow and opacity um, on here as well. So I'll go and update, put those numbers there. These numbers are random. Like sometimes they're between like 0 and 2 or like 0.1 and 5. I'm going to have to like um, parameterize it, reset it where those numbers somehow get shown to the user either between like 0 or 1 or 0 and 100. That, those numbers actually make sense. Oh, okay. We're going full size or smallest size, full glow or no glow. Um, and that... And so I'll add text to size, color, opacity. I'll add these toggles, whether these things impact the current paint strokes or not. And what I might do is I might pull off this toggle here and make this button, which I didn't, I've never clicked it before. It's resetting. That's interesting. So I got to update this, where when I click this, I think this is going to be the toggle whether this actually is a, has a timer effect or whether the paint stroke just exists forever. And I think that's it. And then the online videos will also cover me saying, okay, here I'm done with the project. I'm going to build it. I'm going to WebGL build it. I'm going to zip it up. I'm going to get up on HIO. I'm going to get the link. I'm going to export out my diagrams. And I'm going to get my Sprint 2 posting to be similar to my Sprint 1, where I'll have a project description, I'll have my user flow diagrams, and I'll have a link. Or I'll, I'll try embedding the project directly into the posting. And I'll have my Sprint 2 posting. And that'll end my online videos. And then you have the week, come in Wednesday, Thursday, you run into issues, and then um, otherwise you have spring break. But I will not be on call on spring break. It's my break too. So if you're going to work, you, that's fine. The drop is at the end of spring break, but I'm trying to get you in sync that in a nice time regiment that you're actually moving forward with your project, wherever technical issues you hit school is still active you come into lab time and if you care to you know you can work on it over spring break or get caught up on spring one whatever but you know i'm in not active teaching mode on spring break so you know fair warned that we have lab times this week and make use of it and i'll get up my example posting and for example here's my user flows for sprint two I went a little bit beyond what my functionalities are, but that's all right. For you, you're going to come up with five user flows. I purposely did four because I want you to create one without even any guidance or following me. So you're going to get your own project description, your own five user flow diagrams, and a link to your project. And my online videos will go through you know, my process of going through it. And um, I just explained the last little updates I'll do to my project. All right. So before I go through my my, my code and how I change the UI, is there any, any questions on that? All right. So let me shrink this stuff up. These color sliders used to sit out into the hierarchy of my user interface. So um, all I did was go game object UI. I created, you could create anything. Just make sure you create a UI element. In this case, I created a text element and I could just remove that text. All I'm left with is this rec transform. I'm just using it as an empty holder. So you can zero it out place objects underneath it, name it something, uh, some type of group, you know, some type of UI group that relates to some part of your UI. 
and you can start dragging stuff underneath it. The point of that is if you see when I take this color slider here, I can move them all at once. So if I need to reposition them, I don't need to move one slider, move the other, move the other, make sure they're all lined up with each other. They're all together. So that's the point of having this parent UI object, and that's how I created it. So for the sliders, actually, all I did was, yes, this text element used to live underneath this button. Um, and it used the, the actual number used to sit over there. All I did was take this text element, drag it underneath the handle. And if I turn the handle on and off, it's just this circle graphic. And so I took the circle graphic and I just made it whatever color, red, green, blue, or whatever it relates to. And I just dragged the text element underneath there and I hid, I turned off the button. And the text element was set, originally was set at like a size of 14 and you see that it's too big. So all I did was just size that down and position it so that it sits on the handle. And since it's a child of the handle, it actually moves with the handle now. And since I didn't uh, delete this or anything, all the connections were the same. So if I go up to click detector here, down here, whenever we say, for example, drag on the red slider, this is the method call that's that's being um, that's being evaluated with the temporary float. This is the UI text that's being updated. So we go from zero to one to change the color, but for to make it something that's more easy for the user to read, I multiply it by 100 and I cut off the decimal part. Now it reads zero to 100. And that red, that text red, this is the text that we're updating. It's still the same text. I just moved it out of the button game object, moved it underneath the handle, turned off the button, resized it, repositioned it. And so I didn't have to create any additional code. I didn't have to update my references. And when I click play, Now this number comes along with, with the handle because it's a child and the number is being updated from zero to 100 as I move the slider. And say if I pull out all red, then there's no red being cast, or being drawn onto these new shapes. So everything functions the same, but I was able to get rid of those three squares, those three buttons. I just colored the handles and put the number, that text object, I, put it underneath the handle. And again, I just put a group on it so it's easy to move. And originally the group didn't have a um, alignment on it. It was just centered up like this. So if you notice, if I rescale my UI, notice how my, my color sliders aren't being readjusted nicely if the window gets resized. So to deal with that, the parent group, just align it to the bottom left, just like the sliders used to be. So now when I move it, the sliders still stay, stay nice and, and aligned into the bottom corner of my window. So actually I went through and I had to realign all these because I have a group here for them. And as I created that and I created these sliders, I had to make sure they're aligned so that the UI stays nicely in the corner if the window does get scaled. The only one that has an issue really is this AM up here sitting on the clock because the clock actually exists like out in a 3D world and so um, no matter how I reposition this it's like putting a 2D object on a 3D object. It's, it's um, this I would actually make a separate UI canvas. And instead of being in 2D, you would just put it in world space. You know, just sit it right in front of the clock. You know, always be there with the clock. But I'm fine. I don't see the window going anything more like this or this and they end right there. So I'm fine with it. All right. So paint sliders, that's this size, glow, and opacity here. So slider size, this existed before. 
I didn't really make use of it that well, and now I think it's it connects well with with the features. So nothing is pretty new to it. it it's still calling uh, change size. It still goes between 0.1 and 2 and defaults to 5. So if I go to change size, there is some new stuff I added to it. So this is all new. Change size used to read in the float from the slider, and all it did was change size. Now what did this size connect to? I'll get to this part afterward. Let me first talk about size. So size up here is a float defaulted to a half, and I only used it here. So it used to be it was only used here and here, and I guess the Z part, yes. So this here, if the last click position is a vector 3, 0, we just set the scale to this, else do that. So this means if this object is the first object of a paint stroke, meaning there's no previous object to compare to, so if the user for the first time the app is running doing a paint stroke or if they've released the mouse button and they've clicked it back down and they're creating a new paint stroke this is the first object and there's no, no other paint object to compare it to we just put a random scaling on it just so it's not too big it's not too small whatever then the others all the other paint strokes paint objects in our stroke we look at the last position and we do some morphing on it. So I'll get to that in a second. But this one, when you messed with the size scale, only used to impact that first object. So it was kind of useless. But now if you can see I go through here, we have size used in every paint stroke. That's this line that's commented out, this is what the lines used to look like. So what we used to do is for both X and Y, we would find the last position. So for X, where was that last paint object drop down in the X? What's the difference from where we are now to where we were? We do an absolute value on that so that it's always positive because we don't want scales to be negative. Then just to make it look a little bit more interesting, we just multiply it by a random number between half a unit and three units. So that either scales it down a little bit or it scales it up up to three times. And then we clamp it between 0.1 and 5, meaning whatever this value is that gets spit out of this distance check multiplied by this random number, we clamp it to 0.1 to 5. If it's too low, if it's 0, if it's a negative number, it's going to be 0.1. If it's too high past 5, we just clamp it to 5. Any number in between stays that number. Now, the reason I picked 0.1 is because we don't want scales of 0 or negative scales. So that's as small as it gets where you can actually see it. And the reason we picked 5 is because I, I kind of I placed the object in the center of the screen and I was scaling it. So a scale of 5 was like covering a third of the screen. A scale of 10 was like covering two-thirds of the screen. And then 15 was like the whole screen. So I figured, okay, 5 is about right because you don't want these paint objects to be too big. So the largest it will ever be is about a third of the screen. Sure, that's fine. Now, how do we start to make that more dynamic? Well, some of these hard-coded numbers I started to replace with size. So size defaults to a half a unit. And our size slider goes to 0.1 to 2. So we can either make something super small but still visible or like twice as big as whatever it was. So all right. And then we're defaulting to 0.5. So I, can, I know I can go in and say, well, 0.5 I can just replace with size. Our minimum random roll. Sure, I'll let the user mess around with that. Whatever they manipulate size, that will update that value. And we know that 0.5 was kind of felt right. And size defaults to 0.5. 
So I just replaced it with size. Our max of our random roll is three. Well, size is a half a unit. So 0.5 times six equals three. So I was like, all right, just do size times six. And that's the max. So as the user changes that size slider, it's updating both the minimum and the maximum that this random number gets multiplied into the core of our function. The core is what? where was this last paint object? What's the distance between that and where we are now? The reason for that, that tells me how quickly the user is moving the mouse. Then I just multiply it by some random number that is now heavily influenced by this size slider that they're manipulating. And it's going to impact our clamping function too. So at the end of the day, what are the actual min and max of the values that we can set our new scale to? So I, I leave it hard. I, I left the minimum hard coded to 0.1. I don't really see changing that. I mean, sure, you can do 0.1 uh, and, and somehow impact it by size or set size to min, but 0.1 is fine because you don't want to go to zero and you don't want to go to negative, and 0.1 is like the smallest you can ever see. Sure. Then our max used to be 5, so I just did scale times 10, 0.5 times 10. So if you ramp up your size, which goes to 2, you know we'll get a chance that we'll be able to go to 20 or something super big. Or if you scale it down to, I think it's the smallest, 0 0.1, 0 0.1 times 10, the most it can be is 1. So that's a nice um, distribution space. You can change it if you choose to. But that is how I decided to let the user impact this sizing of their paint strokes. And then Y goes through the same calculations, but just for Y. And then Z is just the average of X and Y. X plus Y divided by 2. I don't see a reason to change that. It's just to give it some, some change in the Z based on however big X and Y are. And then we set our scale. So that's now how size is impacting. So let me go back to size and let me just cancel out this for each loop so with what I just explained this was the method at its current state last week and just changing how we're spawning the scale of new paint strokes So I can adjust the size of new incoming paint strokes, and the old ones stay the same. All right. And so I can turn off paint destroy and say, here's the smallest it'll ever get. Here's the largest it'll ever get. Maybe the large is too large. Maybe I want to clamp down on this size times 10, maybe I should do size times 5. But you can update your own app as you see fit. I'll clear it out, and here's something in between. Sure, looks good to me. So letting the user dynamically update the size variable works well. But it's not impacting the currently existing paint strokes. So how do we do that? So I'm going to bring back this for each loop. And if you notice, um, we had already discussed the for each loop up here when you click the clear button and it calls this destroy objects method. We loop through each transform that exists as a child of this script's game object. So this script lives on this click detector game object. 
when we create new paint objects, we make this script's game object the parent. And that is why when we paint, all the objects go underneath this object, which makes it super easy to go find them later. So in this case, we use this for each loop, go through every child transform and destroy its game object. And that's how we can destroy everything. So I can use that same structure, that same for each loop, to go through find everything again. And what are we going to do to it? Well, let me do this one first. Let's say, OK, maybe we want to update the each of these children are transforms, so I can just say child.local scale and go right to the scale of it. And let's um, multiply it by the new incoming number. So this size float can be anywhere from 0.1 to 2. And I'll paint stuff in, and you see it makes stuff really big, really small, and eventually I lose track of it. So let me just turn this off, the, the destroy. So notice like right away, things are getting too out of control, and eventually if I keep cycling this back and forth, they either get um, too small or too big. So we're, we're constantly multiplying this new value, which is between 0.1 and 2, into its scale. So scale is a vector 3 in x, y, and z. And so this is like shorthand of saying the new scale, the x, whatever the current x is, multiply it by this, this float, this temp. Whatever y is, multiply it by this float. Whatever z is, multiply it by this float. And then you have this new vector. But you can just say, here, multiply this vector by this float. It'll go through each of the x, y, and z and do the multiplication for you and create the new vector. But the problem is this temp is either a fraction, like 0.2, or it's something getting close to 2, like 1.6. And when you constantly multiply it, either it's going to get so big that it's outside the camera view, or it's going to get so small that you can't see it. So what I'm really looking at is, OK, we've already done this um, scale evaluation up here. So based on this paint stroke that we've already created, we've already gone through and found the distance from it in its previous paint stroke, the one that was painted previous to it. That information is already embedded in its scale. So all this really is is a relative change. So we know where we're currently at, and we just want to change it some fractional amount, some relative movement based on this float, this size float. So for example, say when he was created, this current paint stroke that we're iterating through our for each loop, say when he was created, this size variable was at, um, was at 1. Right, And then say we change the variable to 2. Now what are we really saying is that however he was generated is x, y, and z. That size variable that affected it was at 1, and then we changed it to 2. Or we want to grow its current scale factor is times 2. Whatever x, y, and z is, we want to multiply it by 2. All right, so that, that means that um, what we're really looking at is a, is a relative change from where we were to where we are now. So the new one really looks like the new one we want to multiply and then divide by the old one. So 2 divided by 1 means everything should grow by 2. So say we're at 1 and we move the slider to 0.5. So we want to shrink everything. So if we have 0.5 divided by 1, we would shrink it. 
and then take whatever that is, multiply it by the vector, we would end up shrinking our x, y, and z by half. So it looks like wherever we're currently at in our x, y, and z of our scales, we want to multiply it by this new scaling factor and divide by our old scaling factor. And we'll get that fractional difference. So wherever we were in our size from 0.1 to 2, um, take the new one, divide it by that. So take the new size, divide it by the old size, and multiply that fractional difference into our vector, and we'll keep that correct scaling on this object. So down here, I say local scale equals whatever local scale was, x, y, and z, multiply it by the new scaling size that the user wants, and divide by its old scaling size. And then notice how I update size afterwards. So the order of operations matters here. We have size, which was what it was at. We have temp, which is our new size. And then we have this object that has this scaling information. So if I went size equals temp and then went into this for each loop, size equals temp, we're just going to get back to this situation where we take the scaling information and just multiply it by this new scaling factor, which as you see, doesn't work. It gets out of control. It either keeps multiplying too big or too small after a while. We have to adjust it. Take the new scaling amount, divide it by the old scaling amount, go through each part of our vector and multiply it by that relative scaling size. And then when we're done with that, we can go and update our size float so that when the user is done manipulating the slider, he can go back and start painting, and now the new size variable is updated for those new strokes. So, for example, I start painting, we default at a size of 0.5, which happens to randomly, because I'm using a random range in there, create some effects like this. Let me turn off times amount. And then as I scale it up, this is the most it'll ever get to, and scale it down. And then I can just keep going back and forth, and you see that. It's keeping within that boundary, no matter how much that math is, is being updated. Every time I move this slider, that method call is happening, and we keep multiplying new size by old size, get that fraction, multiply our, our scale by that. All right. So that's probably the most complicated math that happened this week, is that whole dealing with the size. Both when we create objects and when we need to update pre-existing objects, their size. Now, before I move on to glow and opacity, is there any questions on that all right so this element this size UI the scale the um, slider used to be really big the slider was like like a width 120 or something but I found that interacting with this slider up here it kind of felt good there's nothing wrong with this small of a slider so I went through and minimized all the sliders to give myself some screen real estate and then for the color, I didn't find a compatible situation with size, glow, and opacity, so I kind of left the, the names. I just kind of shrunk the buttons down and positioned them up top here. So instead of emission, I said glow, because I think glow is 
a user would understand that more than the emission, which you kind of have to understand computer graphics to know what that means. And it's a long word. So this is why I chose these names. This is why I organize them. And they kind of all have to deal with paint strokes um, beyond just a straight color. So that's why they're together. And I group them just similar to the color slider. And I had to put the, um, the alignment, the anchor, in the bottom left. So before I go on to glow and opacity, our emission and opacity, and describe how we're messing around with the colors, um, let me talk about, oh, if, you're, if you are updating the scripts, just know that I, I did not have to add any more variables for where we currently are. Once we move into um, opacity, I did have to create a float, and I'll cover that. But all this already pre-existed for this week. So um, I'm going to comment this out. And this is where we were last week as well. I'm going to cover this debug statement. But this if statement was as it was last week. And let me show you what happened. Let me turn this off. I'll paint some objects over here and I'll use the slider. Notice how I'm still holding down the slider. I'm still interacting with the slider, but I'm deleting objects. And if I paint objects right behind it, even if I don't move my mouse right off the slider, if I just use a slider, it's deleting objects behind it. And then users might also drag the slider and keep moving the mouse off of the UI element. And I have to consider these two cases that I need to check if the user is using a user element. And if so, we shouldn't be deleting objects. So by default, the user is using um, left drag on sliders. And if you remember left drag, I'm also using to delete objects. So I'm in this situation where I need to figure out if the user is interacting with the user interface. And if so, I shouldn't be executing the feature that we created, the functionality for left dragging, which happens to be deleted. So take a look down in the console. Let it wipe out again. So notice this true statement is constantly updating. It's constantly saying true. So it's in our update loop. And this number is growing. Every time we're going through the update loop, it's saying true. Now notice when I drag on this, now it's saying false, and notice the number by false. In fact, I'll just, I'm still holding down my, mess, my uh, left mouse button, and I'm technically still interacting with my user interface slider. Notice how false is still growing. It's still becoming false as we're going through the update loop. And then I'm going to release my mouse button. It still thinks I'm interacting with the user interface element, but I'm going to click. And now it's going back to true. It's saying I'm not interacting with the user interface. So I have a way to show. Now it's saying false. Now it's saying true. So I have a way to know now if I'm interacting with the user interface or not. And that happens to be this here. The event system dot current dot current selected game object. This will let you know if you're clicking on a user interface or not. So to use it, we have to say using UniEngine.EventSystems. I'm going to bring in that library. And when we call this, it's either going to return null, which means it's not pointing to anything, or it will return a reference to the game object that we're clicking on. So um, in the game object has to be, is, is connected to the event system. The event system, if you remember, just gets created by default when you create a user interface. And so these game objects that the event system is watching are only game objects related to your user interface, not the stuff that we're creating. So if you're clicking on or dragging on a game object that's connected to the event system, which in this case is just anything in the user interface, 
it will actually give a reference to that game object. So it's like a variable that we've used before, colors, vector threes, game objects, that act as pointers, references. And if you're not clicking on anything, it returns null. So then I can create this statement, which says, whatever this evaluates to, is it equal to null? So if it is null, null equals null, it'll be true. If it is pointing to something, meaning you are clicking on something in the user interface, it'll return some reference to it. A reference does not equal null, it'll return false. That's why when I was clicking on something, it was saying false. And when I wasn't clicking on something, it was saying true. So that allows me to bring back this part of my if statement. And now I can just say, if the user is holding down the left mouse button, get mouse button, not down, not up, if they're currently holding it down, zero for left, and this statement is returning true, meaning it's returning null, because null equals null would return true, meaning the user is not clicking on a user interface element. So this part will only be true if the user is not clicking on a user interface element. That's the only case this will be null, and only null equals null will be true. This has to be true, and the user has to be clicking down on the left mouse button. Then we're going to delete stuff. Well, technically, we shoot out a ray through the camera, wherever the mouse is. We see if that, we do a ray cast through it. We see if it hits something. We see if whatever we hit is on a layer 12, which I called painted object, which all of my prefabs that I spawn are on that layer. And if so, then we destroy those that game object. So with this code now, I don't have to worry about deleting stuff as I'm interacting with the user interface. All right, I just had a time destroy on it. Cool, yeah, yeah, this here? UniEngine.event systems. So this actually solved another issue for me. This is why I was originally right-clicking to create stuff and then left-clicking to delete so that when I was clicking on a user interface, I wasn't spawning stuff too. Um, in fact, I'd written down, that's something I'm going to do with the online videos. So my itch.io builds, I, I put on my website, and um, you can go to them. You can They'll play on mobile, so you can go to your phone and, and um, to your itch.io build. But um, a right click on phone is, is two fingers, and a left click is one finger. So it's kind of weird, and it's not intuitive. So when it first loads up, if a user didn't know the app, they're going to go this, and this really means delete, and they would have to know to do this to paint. So I'm going to switch this now that I can tell when I'm clicking on the user interface and I'll do it during the online video. And I'll say left click to paint so that when it's running on mobile, it's one finger to paint. And then I'll put like a little text somewhere that like two fingers to, to uh, erase. All right, so I covered this debug, I covered event systems, I covered why I'm doing this additional check down my if statement here. Now we just have to cover glow and opacity, and we're good. So I, I think, if I remember right, I think opacity was easier to start covering. So these two are new. Change emission strength change opacity strength. Emission strength already happened to have an emission strength variable that we're already using. Oh, it's a float. If you remember when we create an object, 
we randomly generate the red, green, blue based off the UI sliders that the user can interact with. We've already have this color variable. We put all this information in. And this used to say 0.5. We had hard-coded our opacity. But now we don't have to hard-code it. I can expose it to the user. So I just created this variable to float called opacity strength, and I set it to a half a unit because that's what we had hard-coded it to. So now we use that variable instead of a value. But we still pass everything into a color variable. We still set our color to that with whatever we're currently painting. Then we, we still have this color variable called painted object emission. And we create a new color with that. And we're basing it on the red, green, and blue of the current color we just generated. We just multiply it by emission strength which goes from 0 to 1. So either we have full emission, full glow, based on the color information, so that the emissive color and the regular color are the same. They add to each other. Otherwise, you get stranger effects. And if the emission strength is getting down towards 0, you get a very, very low RGB for our emission color. Um, there's no alpha for emission. And then we set the actual emission color of this currently painted object that's about to be created and placed to that. In the way we do the set colors, we, we, these are what the, the parameters are start with these underscore is the name of it. And then we set the actual value on it. So this is new. And all I did was create these sliders just like the others. Glow goes from 0 to 1, defaults to half. So it's okay to have 0 glow, our emission, because it's just, it's just uh, the lighting is just determined by the light source, the directional light we have. There's no glow. And it's calling this change emission strength, which, pat which receives in a float. And we have this opacity slider which is very similar, but the min value I have at 0 0.01. And the only reason for that is because um, I didn't test it, but if a zero does make it fully invisible, it doesn't make sense because what you're going to paint invisible objects. You're never going to see it. It's just going to frustrate the user. So I don't have the minimum set to zero here, but everything else is the same. Max is one, defaults a half unit, um, and it calls this change opacity strength method. So let's ignore the for each for now, although you've seen it quite a bit. You, you know what I'm going to do with it. All this does is pass in the temp and it changes opacity strength. All opacity strength is doing is whenever we're creating new objects and we're creating a new color for it, it's setting the alpha somewhere between 0 and 1. So that's fine, but if we wished to update, I'm sorry, I'm down here with opacity. If we wish to update previously existing paint strokes opacity, we're going to have to go through the for each loop, find them all, and then I'm going to make use of my color variable. It's more of like a reference holder. And right now, if the user is messing with the user interface, messing with the slider, I know that he's not painting. So I know that this reference variable is empty. It's not making, it's not being used right now. The only time it's being used is when the user is actually painting and I'm generating these random colors, popping it into this color variable holder and passing that to this new, this newly instantiating painted object and passing it into its material. But since the user is messing around with the user interface, I'm just repurposing this variable. It exists, and I can make use of it. So how am I using it? I'm saying, OK, there's, I know that I'm looping through all these pre-existing painted objects. I'm currently at one of them in this loop. 
I'm going to say, all right, go get your color. So child dot get component, get to render, get its material, and use this get color. And what am I getting? Well, it's underscore color. That's just what the parameter is called. Passing it to my color variable. Then I can mess around with my color variable. I can create a new color. Multiply the R, the G, and the B of this color information. Multiply it by this temp float. So, oh, I'm sorry. I was with opacity. I started selecting the emission. Let me just move down here and hide the emissive part of this right now. So we're, we're pulling in the color information from whatever child that we've looped through, the whatever previously existing paint object, pushing it into our color variable. And then we're updating the alpha so I was getting ahead of myself with the emission. Pulling this float, which goes from 0 0.01 to 1, and just update our alpha variable. We don't have to consider where it was previously. We know it's always just going to be set 0 0.01 to 1. And then we pass that back. We say we've updated this color information. So go get the render on this object. Go to its material, and then we're going to call set color. What color are we setting? Well, it's underscore color with a capital C, and then we're passing in the value, which is RGBA, uh, and we've just manipulated the A, really. Then when we're done with that, we're just going to update our opacity strength so that when we go back or the user starts painting again, the objects have the new opacity to it. So with that, I can paint, and I'll just turn off the timer. So now I can go from fully opaque to fully not. I can turn off the glow. This is kind of what's left is this like reflection. This is the specularity, which we could ramp this down as well. But in this class, I'm not doing it. So you just type the glow. Again, if it's AM or PM, you can mess with how opaque and how glow, how much glow you want. So now our new strokes get impacted as well as our old. All right. So the emissive slider is very similar to opacity, except it goes from flat zero to one. Whenever the user messes around with it, we pass in the float. And the for each loop is very similar. Get the current color information from the object in the loop, put it into our color variable, then use that information, the RG and B. And for emission, we're not concerned with A. Multiply it by the temp. So wherever we currently were, just multiply it by the new one, and we get our new number. So we have RGB, and then we're going to pop that information into emission. So whatever the color information is, that emission slider will always multiply against that, that base color, that core color doesn't matter what the old emission rate is. I don't have to do that kind of like fractional multiply I was doing with the scale because I have access to that core color that we pulled the original emission from. So I just go get the core color, multiply it by the new emission strength, pop that in to the emission color. Override our emission color because I went back to the, to the original color information, multiply it by the new emission rate, and override the emission color. And then we update our emission strength with the new one so that when we paint new objects, we use that new emission strength value for new painted objects.
And so that's why I can paint and mess with existing and new objects, their new glow. If I have time, I'll see if I can add specularity. I'll probably just ramp that down with the glow, because if you are the opacity. The user doesn't need to know about all these different parts, as long as it looks like the whole object is going invisible. So I'll do those updates. So add text to size glow color, add, add the numbers here. So as you see, we're going from zero to one. Most of the time that might make sense in this number here. Uh, but for example, the size of 0.1 to two, the user doesn't understand that. I'm gonna have to um, map it to a new range. And then update, I wanna switch. Now left click will paint, right click will clear. And because I can know if I'm clicking on the user interface or not, I can update that. I gotta mess around with the specularity and then I'll go through the build and posting process. And so I'm complete with, I'll go through, create this in the online videos. My project is complete, my project's built, my posting is complete, I'm done. And then you go forward and wrap up your project. All right, so again, the posting is going the structure of it will look like this, but it's going to be new information. We have new project description, new user flows, five of them. There'll be a link, and then I'll embed it. I'll make sure that the embedding works this time. But at least there's a link as a backup. Yeah. We just have to embed it on the video. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually really straightforward. There's these thing called widgets here. And then you just go to embed, get, you copy this, and then edit, and you actually just do edit HTML code, just paste it right in there. It was working other times. Right now, I don't know why. Yeah, paragraph start and end. But in either case, I'll figure it out and I'll post it. Oops, that's not it. But um, if you have questions, hang out. Work on your project or head out. Just make sure to start work before Wednesday, Thursday. Yeah, it looks like it actually works now. Yep. I just have to change the, the dimensions. You have to open up the the height on this, but it, it works like right little. So there's probably some type of width and yeah height. Let's change that. Maybe like 700. Yep, yeah, there you go. But I'll do this complete. I'll do it on the online video. But you see, you can play your player demo right here. It also plays on mobile too. You could give it a try. <laughs>